Hey guys, did you just start a low carb, high fat diet or a ketogenic diet? And you're looking to see, can you adapt to a high intensity interval training type sport like CrossFit? Well, if you're like me, you went looking for research and you really didn't find much. So I decided to test it for myself to see what is true and how far I could adapt. So I tested the five 2018 open workouts and five girls and compared my PRs and best times to how I did in ketogenic diet. If you're interested in seeing those results along with different research that I've come across and the limitation and benefits of a ketogenic or a low carb diet while training, stay tuned. So first let's talk about the energy systems themselves. Everything that you're trying to do is to create ATP. That is the form of energy that's available at a cellular level that the body can use to do all of its functions, which is already available on site for maybe like a one rep max or to lift a Buick off of your mom. I'm not sure why you're in that situation, but let's just say you are. You could actually lift something right away. You have that energy on demand. So everything's trying to get to ATP production. So the first one, the quickest demand, we're lifting a few reps maybe, something that's a, maybe a sprint, is the creatine system or the phosphagen system. I'll say creatine for short. That's why the supplement creatine works. It lends you that energy. It super saturates the muscle with it so that you can create ATP quicker. There's more energy on demand to be created. So that's a very high intense, low rep, sprint-like type of workout. Three, four, five reps, maybe a few reps higher. The next system based on intensity or duration would be the glycogen or glycolytic, which is really just sugar or glycogen stored within the muscles themselves, which is the next fastest thing. And we have a pretty big supply of this, so the body can keep creating it quickly to create ATP. It can keep turning it over quickly to create ATP. So that's something that is very important typically for any, most people and almost all of us in a high intensity sport like CrossFit or if you're doing high reps like bodybuilders, maybe 10 reps, 15 reps, you're going to notice that you're going to perform better with that if you have glycogen on demand. And the last one is the oxidative pathway or the fat pathway, which means that there is oxygen available so that oxygen can be used with fat to create energy. So it's a slower pathway. It can't call on the demand of it as quickly as it can these other systems. But the good part is we have almost an unlimited supply of fat so you can keep going in that domain. So long, slow work you can keep doing because the body can produce energy. So as you look at the chart, you can see that at different intensities and duration, there's different contributions from these different energy systems. And one of the things that's cool about CrossFit is that we have to call on all of these energy systems at different workouts. So that's how we have to be balanced in our approach to our training, because we can't get so strong at one thing to the detriment of another. So I can't be so good at lifting one rep that I can't run around the block, and I can't be so good at running that I can't be explosive and jump and be powerful. And that's what's interesting about CrossFit. But the energy demands that we need to support it are also extremely important, and that's why nutrition is so important to our performance. So as you can see with the red line and the blue line specifically, if we have a high intense demand on us, such as a few reps, or to sprint for a long distance, or to go do 15 reps shoulder to overhead, run around the building, come back in, hop on a rower, and we're doing as fast as we can, that's placing a high intense demand for energy on the body, so we need to create that energy quickly, and the systems that are built to do that are the glycolytic and the phosphagen pathways. So supplementally or dietary wise, it makes sense to support those systems to improve performance. I mean, there's no doubt that carbohydrates are a quick source of fuel. But as we've tested athletes over the years, have our limitations on a fat adapted diet only been because we never test truly fat adapted athletes? Have we shown that performance is tied to carbohydrate intake only because they're the only people we've ever studied, people that have spent their entire lifetime eating carbohydrates, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70% of their calories are coming from carbs. One of the biggest things that I had a problem with when I was researching all of this is that all of the research studies people that go on a low carb, high fat diet for like two weeks, 
maybe four weeks. There's not really much out there for people that actually really get adapted. So my problem with this is you spend an entire life being a sugar burner, a carb burner, being reliant on a system. Everything from sports performance standard is measured in that way. So they're looking at people that have used carbs. So obviously they're dependent on that system, the enzymes, the processing, what's being stored within the muscle is all tweaked out for that metabolic system. And that makes sense. So when we have more carbs, it enhances our performance. But then they just say that you can't adapt in these other realms, in these other areas to a high fat diet, which I just kind of felt was short-sighted in the research or how we've evaluated this because no one's actually fat adapted in these studies. So that's why I had to test for myself and see what was my potential and could I at least get back to baseline from a performance standpoint so I can enjoy my workouts the way I always have, except with the health benefits that a low carb lifestyle provides in reducing insulin and disease and all of the other problems that come with excess carbohydrates. Now before we actually get into how I did and some of the other things that I've come across, especially from Finney and Volek's work and their research, I want to point out that in no way am I trying to say that a ketogenic diet is best for a CrossFit Games athlete or a super high intense sport, possibly, you know, even basketball and football, what I'm trying to say is that the common person out there who is live, wanting to live a healthy diet, can they get back to baseline? Can they perform really well? If you're doing a few workouts a week, can you even PR and be better than you've ever been on a keto diet or a low-carb diet because of all the benefits you get from it that we are about to get into? Well, as I saw with my own tests, I could. All right, guys, so let's look at the 10 workouts that I tested in my little personal experiment or my N of 1, as you would say. So I uh, tested the open workouts, as I mentioned in the introduction, along with five girls. I did specifically pick these girls because I thought they would challenge the weakness in a ketogenic diet or a low-carb diet in that they rely heavily on that glycolytic pathway. Now they are short, so it's not like I did these workouts five times in one day like I'm at the CrossFit Games, but the workouts themselves are very glycolytic demanding, sugar demanding due to the intensity and the weights. Specifically Grace, Fran, and Isabel. Obviously Helen and Jackie are lighter, but they are sprints. So they're not like these long drawn out workouts. They are something that you're supposed to kind of get done pretty quick. You'll notice in either of them, whether it's carb adapted or fat adapted that I am an average CrossFitter. No! We suck again! I am not an amazing, considering going to the games type of athlete. Uh, I do it for health, I do it for fun, I do it to be social, I do it because of my business. But um, it's something I enjoy doing and I have fun with, but at no level, at no point in time am I trying to say that I did this ketogenic diet and you know went to the 2018 games like I said before. So if we look across the top here, you will see that the, uh, the wads the PR or carb adapted score, either in reps or time, the PR date, uh, specifically for the girls, when I tested them fat adapted what my score was, the date that I tested them on, and the weeks adapted uh, that I was, uh, which really just means how many weeks into my ketogenic diet I was, and then obviously the percent change. Now, some other things to know, in this time I was 10 pounds lighter uh, by the time I was testing my the fat adapted scores that you see there, uh, I went roughly from 178 pounds down to 168 pounds. What some other interesting things were, I actually PR'd my deadlift during this time, which is something I have not PR'd in four or five years. So it's a number I could just never get over four or five. I could lift four or five for multiple reps, but I can never lift more than it for once. Uh, and I finally did that. Uh, and it happened to be when I was keto, <laughs> I was not doing any deadlift program or strength program, kind of just randomly doing some strength and PR'd it. Uh, I also tied my bench press, the best bench press score that I've had in two years. Actually, it was the best bench press score that I had in two years. It was 10 pounds under my all-time PR, but I have not been able to get close to that in a while. So my all-time PR is 315. I hit 305 while in a keto state. Once again, not following any specific program for bench. Uh, kind of just getting in there and hitting it with, with the fellas once in a while. And uh, happened to hit 305, which is a number 
I was actually 20 to 30 pounds under that for the last two years. I haven't been able to really crack 285 for a while. So there's some really cool stuff that happened while I was keto, which I found interesting considering I was 10 pounds lighter and I had no carbohydrates. Um, and these are numbers that I have, I've been struggling to hit for years now. The interesting thing part about actually going into both um, tests, whether it was carb adapted or fat adapted for the open, was that I went into both similar. And I purposely did structure it this way because uh, I didn't want to go into the fat adapted state like training, my, training like crazy. So I had an unfair advantage. Whereas every year I go into the open during the open pretty untrained. You know, maybe I'm doing two workouts a week. I'm not really doing much strength. I might do one or two strength sessions a week, but I'm not really training like an animal by any means. I'm kind of jumping in randomly here and there. And that's kind of how I go into the open. And I use the open to get me into shape. Uh, I enjoy the open. I enjoy doing it with all of our friends and our members. It's fun. It's just fun. And it's something I use uh, a little friendly sport to uh, get me into training. And I normally ride that out until the mid late summer where we do a local comp. Um, as you guys know, the, we'll do like the brawl and the burbs or whatever. And then after that, I kind of like, so that's kind of how I do half the year on, half the year off. Uh, going into the fat adapted one, I actually was not training that much because I started to pick up my intensity and in training three weeks into the keto diet. I mean, the first two weeks, you're just a nightmare. I actually would recommend everyone to be safe the first few weeks of doing a keto diet and CrossFit. Your body's not ready to make energy. You place an insane demand upon it. Uh, and I think it's just not healthy for it. Uh, it actually put me in a unhealthy state. I feel like it was actually day 19 uh, where I was doing a number of intense workouts that week because I started to feel really amazing. Uh, but my body was just not ready yet. So I backed off and I backed off also on purpose knowing I was going to test the opens and do redo this little personal experiment. So I went into the fat adapted workouts as well weeks after not training hard at all, maybe doing one or two workouts, going really light with them. Uh, and then went into it. So I was not super conditioned. I was not in my best state. Um, so I felt like it was very comparable for both. Uh, and as I go on in the open, whether it's regularly the open or in the fat adapted state, I actually continued to pick up my training. So it was very comparable. Psychologically, uh, to set the stage, uh, the benefit of doing the open workouts when the open is going on is that you're with all of your friends on a little Friday night lights and the gym members and there's that fun competitive you know, banter and experience with your with your bros and having a bro session, it's a good time. Uh, whereas when I did the fat adapted ones, I was pretty much either alone or I did it with one or two people. And it's randomly in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the gym, probably interrupting the classes. And uh, so there's not that motivation. But there definitely was a psychological motivation to it get to my same score. And that, I felt, helped and hindered me. It gave me the push to make sure I got the same score, but I felt like it also caused me to settle, especially once I started to actually feel better. And as we get into these scores, you'll see that I PR'd most of them or did better in most of them, seven out of 10. And I actually feel like I would have done much better or at least a little better if I didn't settle mentally, which I feel like I did. I felt like once I knew I, can't, I was going to tie my score, get around it or beat it by a little bit. I kind of really just didn't push it that hard. Whereas I feel like if I was in that open Friday night, you know, with everyone, with my friends, that that you would push it that hard. You're actually pushing it to the limit where when I did these fat adapted ones, I was not necessarily pushing it to the limit of all of them. So let's go through each of them real quick here. 18.1, that is the long rowing one with the hand cleaning jerk. Nothing too heavy. Uh, also some toes to bar. The main thing that I'm going to say about all of these workouts is even if my score is close, a little worse, or a little better, you ju I just felt better in all of them. I did not feel like I was on fire. <laughs> or like the lactic acid was crushing me. I did not feel like my heart was beating as hard. I did not feel as air hungry. It just was more comfortable. Now, I did feel like I just couldn't get above a certain threshold, like maybe the energy wasn't there or that certain intensity, you just the energy system isn't there. But I felt I can go pretty intense, and at no point in time was it as painful as it normally is for me when, just to be honest with you, the entire history of me doing CrossFit workouts. 18.2, I uh, did a little better on this one. This is the burpee one uh, where you have to get over the bar uh, with the squats and uh, 
was very happy to do better in this one. 18.3 was the muscle up and double under one. I actually feel like I would have beaten this one by a few reps, uh, but I kind of settled and thought I was not going to beat it just based on where I was. And as I got to the end of the workout, I realized, huh, if I would have actually pushed that hard like I did when I did the uh, open, I would have actually beat the score. Now, once again, it only would have been by a few muscle ups, but I definitely feel like I would have beaten that one for sure. Uh, the one that I was really excited about was 18.4, which is the deadlift and handstand push-up one. Now, I only beat it by two reps, but this workout is with 225-pound deadlifts and even 315-pound deadlifts, and obviously I only got a few of those or so many of those, but uh, it's the type of workout that I feel like I actually expected to do horrible in this uh, on a keto diet, knowing that some heavy or moderate weights were involved. 18.5, uh, I did do worse. I did better than I did the first time I did 18.5 uh, when I was carb adapted back when the open was going on, but I did not do as well as the second time I did 18.5 back when the open was going on. So uh, I do not like to make excuses, but this was the first day uh, that it was really hot this summer and humid. Uh, the humidity, it was like working out in a fishbowl. Uh, it was so swampy and hot. Uh, it was pretty uncomfortable. I definitely did not do as well. I definitely would not have done as well, even if the weather was better. But I feel like it contributed to the larger percentage that you see at the 8.51%. Um, but in saying that, I was still happy. It was reasonably close. We're, you know, we're talking about a few reps, obviously. And that's a big difference. But um, in a day like that, I was actually pretty happy with that score. As we get to the girls, I was actually super excited about this because these are numbers that I haven't PR'd in years. These are numbers I've been crossfitting for 10 years. Um, and even though I'm not elite, uh, I have had multiple times where I've been training hard, uh, multiple times where I've went after these wads. I've had countless times to try and PR them. And as you can see, I did not PR Grace in four years almost. Uh, Fran, I mean, there's these are years ago that I haven't been able to PR these. So for me to PR them keto really told me a lot. Uh, once again, not saying that this is the best diet for performance, just saying that you can absolutely perform really well uh, living a super healthy lifestyle on a ketogenic diet, which I obviously proved here by PR and Grace, which is 135 pound clean and jerk sprint. Fran, same thing. It's a moderate light weight, obviously with 95 pounds, but sprint with weights and pull-ups, very glycolytic. Helen and Jackie are light, uh, but PR both of them. And then Isabel, I did not PR, but I was nine seconds off uh, and I'll just be honest with you, I'm terrible at the snatch. I'll be like the Iron Chef of Pounding Vage. Uh, if you guys are members of the gym, you know Karen uh, can critique the hell out of me for my form. I kind of muscle a little bit. I don't love the movement. I'm not great at overhead movements, if you guys know me. Uh, so uh, even though it says 4.35%, it is 9 seconds. And uh, I just actually, this is actually the one workout I've retried, fat adapted, because I wanted to see if it was just... I wasn't feeling it that day, and if I had a chance to, to beat it, but I could not. Uh, so that definitely, uh, is, I did not break it. But at the same time, I don't see some dramatically horrible number because I was fat adapted. I'm right in around the same range. So obviously my genetic potential is expressing itself here, whether fat adapted or carb adapted, because the numbers are so similar. So let me introduce some of the adaptations that occur that we're going to kind of dive into a little bit here and why I was able to perform as well in most workouts or even PR First the adaptation that happens is the body is actually storing more fat intramuscularly. So just like as it would store glycogen as an adaptation to training and carbohydrates being available, it's going to store more fat. So that fat is more available on site, which means it can pull it quicker. And this point is demonstrated in Jeff Volick and Stephen Finney's book, The Art and Science of Low Carbohydrate Performance on page 13 and 14, where he says, the other fate of fatty acids taken up by muscle, particularly during a period of rest, is the conversion back to triglyceride within the muscle cell itself where it can be stored as lipid droplets for later use. And this is something that you can see in numerous studies where it's widely recognized that the body can store more intracellularly. And they go on to say that in a well-trained athlete, muscle, muscle cells can store as much energy and fat droplets as they can as glycogen. So clearly there is adaptation going on here as you change your diet and the inputs on the system. Second is it's actually able to do more with the fat and break it down. So enzymatically it's able to like cleave a fat apart almost so to speak and make use of it quicker because the body is upregulating those things. Now here's just one example of uh, gene expression within the muscle 
that Jeff Volek pre- presented at uh, one of his conferences at the Low Carb Down Under presentation in 2015, and he showed this slide, which is showing some of the top uh, gene expression. And if you think that you're just, you know, eat, getting some ketone, ketones, and you're eating low carb, and you know you're losing some weight, and really there's not much behind it more than that, then you definitely need to think again. So when we talk about upregulation and all the changes that are happening in the body and the efficiency. This is expressing it right here and showing that ketones are pretty powerful epigenetic triggers or switches, and they can turn on genes on and off. And this is one of them slides that he presented where he showed some of the things that are affected, uh, the top genes that are affected by ketones and by a high fat diet, where say this top one over here is actually showing all four of these uh, charts are actually showing at the end of the workout, a little while after, and then like about an hour, 20, 120 minutes after the workout. So they're testing the expression of these things. And one of them is a histone inhibitor, which is related to histones. And it's now become known, as Jeff mentions in the presentation, that uh, ketones are histone deacetylase inhibitors. And they are actually widely used or understood in psychology and neurology as mood stabilizers and the anti you know, epileptic effect. So there's that. There's another one over here that is for beta oxidation, which is the use or the breakdown of fat, obviously, or using that fat. So you can see that there's a lot of things at play from ketones now being available, carbohydrates not. One of the other ones is actually preserving glycogen. And he they show in a lot of their research that fat adapted athletes actually recover and replenish glycogen just as fast and at the same rate as high carb athletes and they believe it's because there's a carb or a glycogen sparing effect that happens once the body fully adapts so all these amazing things are happening that take time take i believe the uh, athletes that were going through these this research here were at least 19 weeks and if you want to see a great video on this, definitely look up the low carb down under videos. They have a lot of great presentations, uh, including this one from Jeff Folick. Third is actually because we're relying on fat more and not and less carbohydrates, there's less lactate, we're less acidic. And because we're less acidic, our heart rate is lower, so workouts feel better. So if we go back and look at the art and science of low carbohydrate performance, uh, we'll see on page 34 and 35 where they reference or say there are two main drivers of your respiration. The first is blood oxygen level. So if you breathe harder, your brain perceives low oxygen content in the blood. The second driver is carbon dioxide, which drops the blood pH, which makes you more acidic, and the reduced blood pH increases respiration. And then they go on to say that once you are adapted to a low-carb diet, respiratory quotient at most workouts is lower, which means you are making less CO2 per calorie burned. You are also making less lactate because you're not relying on the glycolytic system as much. You are using fat more for energy. So that both of those make you much less acidic, which in most circumstances protects you against that air hunger. And I think is what I experienced in my wads and it's what I experience every day when I work out now, that it's just more comfortable when I'm working out. And that allows you to kind of continue to go hard because you never really feel like you're redlining at any point in time. Fourth is actually once we make all these adaptations, our intensity level at which we can use fat is pushed out. So if we look at this chart here where research has been done on different participants that those with a high carbohydrate diet have peak fat oxidation or use of energy uh, somewhere around, it looks like about the 50% VO2 max, whereas the low carbohydrate diet actually pushed that way out to maybe 75%. And I read that in higher trained athletes, they can have seen that even as high as peak fat oxidation at 85%. So that means up to 85% intensities, we can still peak out on fat oxidation, which shows you the type of adaptation that you can have if you get fat adapted and change your source of fuel. So if you remember now, when we talked earlier in the video about the different energy systems and the people that they research and study typically, where they are dependent on carbohydrates to produce at high intensity type training, well, if you become fat adapted, it's 
truly showing here that athletes that spend the time to switch their system over, they can produce energy at very high intensity still while on a low carbohydrate diet. Now this chart in their book is actually showing you the percentage of calories, their fuel source. So as time goes on up to looks like three hours here of exercise, uh, the demand or the source of the fuel, the calories burned changes. So in a high carb diet, it does slowly become more fat as the source of fuel, but it only tops out at around 60% of the fat is the source of fuel. Whereas the low carb fat adapted athletes are using almost 90%, 85 to 90% of their source of calories that they are burning and using as a fuel source during exercise is coming from fat. Now, this really doesn't mean much in regards to performance. All that really matters is that the energy can be created, which is what the last chart kind of talked about, that the energy can be created at higher intensities. But what it does speak to is if you were someone who's concerned about losing fat or getting leaner, well, here, would you rather use carbohydrates that you're just going to go replenish when you eat again? Or would you rather use fat, which is you're ripping it right off of you, every exercise is getting right to the point. And this chart is just kind of backing that up, showing that a non-keto adapted athlete versus a keto adapted athlete is using, a keto adapted athlete is using significantly more grams of fat per hour of work. So whether it's, as you can see here, the lowest level participant uh, versus each other, it's almost sevenfold. Uh, the average group here is almost triple. And for the highest level of athletes or conditioned or well-trained athletes that are involved, they are actually almost double. And I've seen other studies that have shown that it's almost maybe two and a half times the amount of fat used as a source of fuel versus the non-keto athlete. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. I really was just trying to show, can a normal CrossFitter trying to work out hard a couple times a week, trying to enjoy their training, can they adapt to a high fat, low carb, ketogenic style diet? And I think I've proven through my results and my personal testing, some of the science, some of the adaptations we've shown that you can, and you actually may even feel better doing it. Now, if you're a high level athlete, I think there's definitely some considerations and there may be limitations to that, but in the upcoming videos in this series, we are gonna get into supplements that you can use, possible carb cycling, and other interventions you could do to possibly super saturate your muscles with carbohydrates so you can do a low carb, high fat diet, and then saturate your muscle with carbohydrates leading up to game day. I hope you enjoy this, and I'll see you in the next video.